If you want to explore playing a two-handed weapon-using powerhouse of a character in Pathfinder 2e, or if you're just interested in finding out more about the class that everyone claims is the most overpowered class in the game, then you're going to want to watch this video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for our favorite TTRPGs. We crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build a character that you are thinking about bringing to your game. So if you enjoy creating characters for role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just interested in getting ideas, tips, tricks for a character that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby. Really quick, if you'd be interested in getting a written step-by-step -step cheat sheet to help you recreate this character yourself without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes, or if you're just looking for a way to lend some additional support to me, to the channel, I would really appreciate it if you would consider joining as a member. There's a little button down there. For $2 a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I make for each and every one of these builds. And it's just a really nice way to support me. So huge shout out and thank you to all of my channel members. You guys are fantastic. And everybody else, you're also fantastic. Just watching and liking and subscribing and ringing the bell are great ways to support the channel. And they do a lot for me. They truly do. So thank you too. So as many of you know, I've often complained on my channel about the way that D&D 5e tends to make dual wielding two weapon fighting pretty lackluster when compared to other weapon dealing character concepts and fighting styles despite my many attempts to do dual wielding as effectively as I can like this. Now, this mechanical gap is largely due to the Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter feats in D&D, right? Something that, admittedly, it looks like Wizards of the Coast is taking steps to correct in the next version of D&D that will be out next year. By contrast, it feels to me like, at least at first glance, two-weapon fighting tends to be the more optimal way to build weapon damage dealers in Pathfinder 2e. I'm not complaining about this, mind you. I love two weapon using characters, but thanks to the very penalizing multi-attack penalty in Pathfinder and the fact that you can reduce that penalty by using agile weapons, which are always one-handed, at least as far as I know. Add to that all of the great ways to buff two-weapon fighting by using class feats like Double Slice or Twin Takedown to further reduce that multi-attack penalty, and two-weapon fighting kind of feels like the no-brainer way to go for high, consistent damage with lots of attacks per turn in Pathfinder. That said, I think I've found a pretty strong exception to this apparent rule, and I'm sure there are several. I mean, heck, it might not even be a rule. But maybe the easiest one is found by building what is often argued, I'm learning, to be the most overpowered class in all of Pathfinder, the fighter. Yep, that vanilla of all vanilla classes, the generic I'm good with weapons person. If you spend much time perusing the reddits and the tubes and the general zeitgeist of Pathfinder 2e, you learn pretty quickly that fighters are considered to be a little broken by most people who know the game. Why is that? Simple, the number two. <laughs> no, not that number two. Thanks to better weapon training, fighters get a plus two to hit more than any other class. Really? Just a plus two to hit? That's what all the fuss is about? Sure, they might have things that help them become even better and stronger, but the plus two seems to be the most damning feature. And to be fair, it makes sense. In a system with math as tight as Pathfinders, where every plus one matters, well, plus two matters twice as much. That's why you often hear and read things like the best rogue in Pathfinder is a fighter with a rogue archetype, or the best barbarian is a fighter with a barbarian archetype, etc. So yeah, I figured that on a channel dedicated to building powerful, fun characters, I needed to put that theory to the test, to actually crunch numbers, to see if the math validates all the complaining. And I think that building them around a big, heavy, two-handed weapon might be 
the best way to stretch that damage as far as we can. I could be wrong, but whether I'm right or wrong, it's definitely a super fun character concept to build around. A hulking, brutish, bull in a china shop character who basically is here to do one thing, smash. And so, I proudly present Pathfinder episode number six, the brute, the mountain, the fighterian, the giant killer, the sledgehammer, attack on titans. How about just the wrecking ball? Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he came up with for this character concept. He does this every week. He's an amazing artist. You guys know this. If you'd be interested in following him to see the other art that he creates or to potentially reach out and try and commission him to create some art for your character or your party, I will put links in the video description as always on how to do so. Now, before the build, you guys, please don't skip. The sponsors today, they're one of my very favorites, and I am convinced that you will love them as much as I do, so if you'll just give me two minutes here. The sponsor this week is a company called Tabletop Candle Company, and they make the most delicious smelling candles in the world, all inspired by your favorite role-playing class archetypes. Now, I am a bit of a sensory junkie. I'm a bit of a hedonist, a bohemian. I'm a foodie. I love beautiful art, I love music and the sound of babbling brooks, and yes, I love wonderful smelling things. And Tabletop Candle Company makes a lot of wonderful smelling things. Plus, they make lots of wonderful smelling things that remind me of my favorite games. Each candle that they make is scented differently, themed around classes. And here are my very favorites. First up, the rogue, this cute little guy. Hmm. Bergamot, cedarwood, and musk. Smells like leather and being enveloped in the warm dark. The cleric, slightly larger size candle here. Ooh, boy, that, that one's getting low. I need to restock that. It's peonies, lavender, and sandalwood. Clean, fresh righteousness. The monk, of course. And yes, their biggest candle sizes come with these like wax dice embedded inside, which is not only awesome, but you can also buy these separately and use like a wax melter or play with them for that matter, if you want your dice to smell delicious. Ooh, sage, orange blossom, and amber. I can feel my chakras aligning as I sniff it. But perhaps my favorite of all, maybe tied with the monk, is the druid. Honeysuckle, Jasmine, and Violet. It smells like a spring glade in the Feywild. You guys, seriously, please check out Tabletop Candle Company and send them your money. This will absolutely add to the ambiance of your next game night or your next soak in the tub while you dream about your next character. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, once I figure out what the main class is going to be for my build each week, I will typically burn the associated class candle while I write the script for inspiration. I'm telling you, it works. Anyway, go here, tabletopcandlecompany.com to check them out. I will put that link in the video description, of course, and if you use the code D4 at checkout, you will save 15% off your entire order. So do that. You will not regret your purchases, I promise. All right, huge thanks to Tabletop Candle Company. I seriously love you guys. Let's jump into the build. Level one, yes, for our class, we're going fighter, and that means we get to pick what our key ability score is between dexterity and strength. And we are going to take strength for this build, bumping it to 12. As for skill training, fighters get training in athletics or acrobatics. We'll take acrobatics, actually, but don't worry, we're gonna end up with both. And then we get three more skills as well. I think I wanna take intimidation for this build, but aside from that, go ahead and pick your favorite skills. As for other proficiencies that we get here at level one, we are trained in all armor and unarmored defense. And then yes, the thing that gets so many people upset, we have expert proficiency in all simple and martial weapons and unarmed attacks, as opposed to just trained proficiency like everybody else. Meaning that we have a plus four to hit from our proficiency, plus our level, plus our strength modifier. That's going to put us at a plus nine to hit right at level one when all said and done. That's pretty amazing. We even get trained proficiency in advanced weapons, which I think is unique for all classes at level one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, it's pretty potent. We'll get back to the rest of our class features in a bit, but for now, let's discuss our ancestry. I think I wanna go dwarf on this character. 
I know my want is to typically go human for that free class feat at level 1, but I don't think we need another level 1 fighter class feat, frankly, and I really love the other things that dwarves give us for this build, not least of which are some really cool thematic and conceptual stuff. First of all, dwarves get dark vision, which seems both harder to come by in Pathfinder as well as more powerful than in D&D, since hidden and concealed enemies can be so much harder to hit, let alone target in this system. As a dwarf, we will bump our strength and our constitution by two each, putting us at 14 and 12, respectively. As for our sub-race or heritage, I don't feel super strongly about any of them, mechanically at least, but I think I'd take Rock Dwarf. My concept for this character is one who is kind of this immovable object or irresistible force. They are the ones knocking their enemies around all the time not the ones being knocked around. Rock Dwarves get a plus two circumstance bonus to their saves against being shoved or tripped, including against spells, and if we are ever forced to move 10 feet or more, we only move half the distance. Situationally, that's pretty powerful, as being knocked prone, especially in this game, can be incredibly punishing, something we'll be trying to take advantage of ourselves here. And yeah, it's just really on point for the concept I have for this character too. We get to choose an ancestry feat at level 1 then, and I'm gonna go with Unburdened Iron. Dwarves only have a 20 feet move speed, and that can be pretty punishing. What's more, we're planning on wearing heavy armor, and in Pathfinder, even if you meet the strength requirements for heavy armor, you still have a minus 5 move speed penalty when you equip it. Well, not with this ancestry feat. What's more, if we're forced to take a move speed penalty for some other reason, we get to deduct 5 feet from that penalty. Again, we're the ones moving people around, not being moved, or slowed for that matter. For our character's background, as usual, it doesn't matter too much what we take so long as, for us, it lets us bump either our strength or our constitution, so we can bump either strength or constitution with the free bump that we then would get, right? I think I'm going to take Martial Disciple and choose training in the athletic skill here, which gives us the quick jump feat, and that can come in handy, and we're going to kind of build off of that actually a little bit. It lets us high jump or long jump with a single action instead of the usual two. And then for our final four ability boosts, we're going to bump strength again, of course, taking it now finally to an 18, constitution then to a 16, and then I want to go charisma to 12 and wisdom to 12. You might be wondering why we aren't taking dexterity to get our reflex saves up, among other things. It's because I would like to have the option to demoralize on this character, meaning that we're going to want a decent charisma. And once we get full plate armor, since it has the bulwark trait, it will let us add three to our reflex saves, at least against damaging effects. So I figure we might as well bump dexterity in favor of charisma so we can be a little better at demoralizing. We are not lithe. We are a boulder. For our starting equipment, I want to buy some splint mail for our armor and then for our weapon I want to get a maul. And that would take all 15 of our starting gold, so hopefully your friends are bringing rations and knapsacks. <laughs> My original plan was actually to use a scythe on this character and then to call them the Grim Reaper and it was going to be so cool. But then I realized that I didn't need a scythe like I originally thought I did and since it's a d10 we'd get more damage out of a d12 weapon instead. Plus I really like both the critical specialization effect on hammers which we'll get to later, and the mall just ended up fitting really well with the theme of this like wrecking ball character that I was building who just smashes everything. So. A maul it is. It does a d12 of bludgeoning damage, biggest weapon die in the game, and also has the shove trait, which means that we could use the weapon to shove or push a creature with the athletic skill even if we don't have a free hand, right? We can just use our weapon to do so. Alright, as a fighter at level 1, we get some great, great features. First, and probably most importantly for us, the attack of opportunity, which, again, most creatures in Pathfinder don't just get automatically. Similar to D&D, this lets us use our reaction to make a melee strike against an enemy within our reach, and 
yeah, to be fair, that means we've got a good argument here for going with a reach weapon instead of the maul, so feel free to do that if you want. But anyway, we get to make this reaction attack whenever an enemy within our reach not only makes a move action, but also a manipulate action or makes a ranged attack. We are going to be taking great advantage of this. We also get the shield block general feat, though we won't be using it on this character. It is a nice way to use our reaction to absorb some damage if we were using a shield. And then we get our first fighter class feat. I want to take Sudden Charge. I've gone on the record many times during my games with uh, Ronald, the rules lawyer. You can watch us do some actual play sessions of Pathfinder there with some other more famous than me YouTubers. <laughs> anyway, I've said a lot. I get super frustrated by having to spend an action to move in Pathfinder. I know, I know, you get three whole actions. How is that worse than having an action, a bonus action, and movement? like you do in D&D. Insert rebuttals about extra attack, no multi-attack penalty, standing only takes half our move speed, etc, etc. Anyway, even with my own limited playtime in this system, I've often found myself frustrated by having to spend two move actions just to get in range of an enemy. If I'm prone, I've got a stand, that's one action, then a stride or a step, a second action, leaving me with only one action to attack, right? Well, for that reason, I think the first thing I want to do on this character, yeah, is take Sudden Charge. This lets us stride two times and make a melee strike against an enemy for just two actions, and that makes me feel a lot better about having these stubby little dwarf legs with my 20 foot move speed. At level two, we get another fighter feat, and I think I'm probably gonna take Intimidating Strike. Brutish Shove is more on point maybe thematically, but shoving enemies is really only situationally useful, not something that we're gonna build around here, and so not necessarily something I'd wanna be doing all of the time. In Pathfinder, as a reminder, shove is not the same thing as trip, right? In D&D, shove can push them or make them fall prone. In Pathfinder, those are two different things. Brutish Shove does have the benefit of making enemies flat-footed, even if you fail on your shove check, but because Brutish Shove has the press feature, it would only make the enemy flat-footed on our third attack on a turn, since press means that you can't use this ability if it's like the first attack on your turn. And how often are we going to be making a third attack on our turn at a minus 10 to hit? Even if they're flat-footed, we're probably gonna miss, right? Not that I won't be seeing what the numbers look like when we do anyway. But also, before long, we're going to have another way to make our enemies flat-footed on this build, so yeah not gonna go that route. Some people might say power attack. I don't love power attack either, to be honest. It takes two actions, counts as two attacks for our multi-attack penalty, but then does one extra die of weapon damage if you hit. It's situationally useful, especially to overcome enemy resistances, I think. But again, before long, we're not gonna have the action economy to use this and what I wanna do. Instead, then, I wanna take Intimidating Strike. It's a pretty great ability, in my book anyway. It's two actions to use, but it lets you make an attack, and then if you hit, you automatically cause the target to be frightened one. Automatically frightened two on a critical hit. And as a fighter, you're gonna be critting a lot. As we talked about at length in the Thief Rogue video, Making an enemy frightened is super potent in Pathfinder as it lowers everything the enemy does, including their attacks, their saves, and even their armor class. But to be honest, Intimidating Strike is mostly going to be a backup option for us before long. As we'll get into in a bit, we're going to be trying to trip enemies on our turn, but that means that we're going to be making a check against the enemy's reflex DC. Sometimes, and this seems to be kind of a recurring theme in Pathfinder, you're going to be running into enemies with high reflex saves, right? Making tripping them a lot harder. And in that case, I want to have something else to fall back on, in our case, Intimidating Strike, to then make them frightened because there's a decent chance that if they have a high reflex save, they might not have a high will save, or vice versa. I want to have Intimidating Strike or a Demoralize option to fall back on to potentially make those high reflex save enemies frightened instead. And yeah, Intimidating Strike is really great in that even if they have a high will DC and so Demoralize isn't going to work against them reliably with Intimidating Strike, if you hit, you just make them afraid. And that's just really cool. As for the skill feat that we get at level 2, 
I want to take Titan Wrestler. Normally, when we try to disarm, grapple, shove, or trip an enemy, we can only do those things against creatures that are no more than one size larger than us, similar to in D&D 5e. With Titan Wrestler, we can do these things against creatures two sizes larger, meaning we can do them against huge creatures as a medium creature, right? And we don't even need the Rune Knight subclass or the Enlarge Reduce spell to do so. We also then at level two get our archetype feat, or at least I'm assuming that we do since about 80% of Pathfinder tables seem to play with the free archetype variant rule. And so I'm going to take, you guessed it, the Barbarian dedication. This is absolutely perfect for us, both mechanically and thematically, and it gave me a chance to really dive into the Barbarian a bit and see what they're all about. So with this dedication, we get training in athletics, or since we already were trained in athletics, a skill training of our choice, pick your favorite. More importantly, we get, we get to rage. rage. Rage is awesome. There are a lot of similarities to rage in D&D and Pathfinder, so let's discuss. First up, it's an action to rage, but then it lasts for a minute. It doesn't end early if you don't take an attack or do damage or anything, only if you fall unconscious. In fact, you can't even end your rage early if you wanted to, which I think is kind of awesome. When you rage, you get temporary hit points equal to your level plus your constitution modifier, so that's five for us right now, and you deal two extra damage with melee weapons and unarmed attacks. Also, that damage is halved if we're going with weak sauce agile weapons. Get out of here with your nimble precision. We do have a minus one to our AC while raging, unfortunately, and we can't take an action with the concentrate trait, which generally means we can't cast spells or do plenty of other things like search or investigate or even actually demoralize for now anyway. As a reminder, real quick, concentrate is not the same as concentration in D&D. That concept doesn't really exist in Pathfinder, though there are sustained spells that sort of imitate it. Anyway, once our rage ends, we simply can't rage again for one minute, but there are no other limits as to how often we can rage in a day, and I love that. Now, with this dedication, we also have to choose a barbarian instinct, which is the barbarian subclass, though we don't actually yet get any benefits from having that instinct. For now, actually, we only get, like, drawbacks. Each instinct comes with an associated anathema, or like creed that stipulates what we just won't stand for. I'm gonna do something that some of you will think is a bad move and take the giant instinct. Despite my friend Sean, AKA Swing Ripper on Discord, having advised me to the contrary. See, giants are ancient dwarven enemies and our character has a personal history and grudge against them for whatever reason. I would definitely build this into your backstory. But in order to defeat giants, we have decided to try and become like them. We're gonna use our enemies' tactics against them. We are a giant among dwarves. We are a force of immense power and destruction. And yeah, okay, later on, the giant instinct gets a little more damage from rage than any other instinct. <laughs> But seriously, my motivation here is at least as much inspired by the concept as it is by mechanics. I swear. Anyway, the giant anathema is failing to face a personal challenge of strength. So if someone challenges you, you better not back down. Because if you do, you will lose all of your instinct abilities for a day, of which we have none at the moment. So I guess it's just kind of flavor for now. At level three, fighters get bravery, which is so cool. It gives us expert training in will saves, which means that we are expert in all saves now, by the way, plus perception too. That's amazing by level three. And also, if you succeed on a will save against being frightened, it's an automatic critical success. And anytime we do get the frightened condition, we automatically reduce its value by one. This means we're almost immune to regular demoralized attempts, among other things. And again, it's really great for us thematically, as I do imagine that we ourselves are going to be demoralizing and intimidating others once in a while on this character. Again, we're the ones that do this thing. It's not done to us, right? We get a general feat at level three as well, and I think I'm gonna take fleet. It just increases our move speed by five feet, so at least we'll have a 25 feet move speed now. That feels a lot better than 20. For our skill increase, at this level, I want to bump athletics to expert as it's super important for all the tripping that we are about to start doing. Because yes, at level four, we get another fighter feat and I want to take 
Knockdown. Knockdown costs two actions, and it lets us make a weapon attack and then immediately follow it up with a trip attempt. And if we're using a two-handed weapon, which we are, we can ignore trip's usual requirement that we have a free hand to trip, meaning we can have our big weapon damage die cake and eat it too by tripping them, without even having the trip trait on the weapon, hence why the scythe ended up being unnecessary. And no, against most enemies, the deadly d10 feature on the scythe doesn't make up for the smaller damage die, on average against most enemies anyways. Against super low AC enemies, sure, go ahead and whip out a scythe. So, the reason this feat knockdown is so great is because the trip action is an attack action in Pathfinder and as such, typically suffers from any multi-attack penalty we may have in effect. With knockdown, although both attacks count toward our multi-attack penalty, the penalty doesn't kick in until after both have been made, meaning we are much more likely to actually trip our opponent and knock them prone. Is knocking an enemy prone so important that it's worth using one of our actions for it every turn? Well, if an enemy is prone, they are flat-footed, meaning a minus two to their armor class. They also have a minus two to hit and can only crawl or stand for move actions. So yeah, this is a great debuff to give an enemy that will benefit your entire party. But also, yeah, some of you see where else I'm going with this, but we'll get into that more when we talk tactics for our damage report in a minute. As for the skill feat that we get at this level, I think I'd take Powerful Leap. I'm kind of going down like a leaping and climbing rabbit hole with this character. I see them as this supreme athlete, and Powerful Leap is nice in that it lets us jump five feet in a vertical leap, something you otherwise have to make like a 30 DC athletics check to do, I think. And it increases the distance we can jump horizontally by five feet too. Situationally, pretty handy. For our Barbarian Archetype feat at level four, I would take Basic Fury, which gives us a first or second level Barbarian class feat. And for that, I think I'm gonna take Raging Intimidation. This gives the Demoralize action the Rage trait, meaning we can now use it, even though Demoralize has the Concentrate trait. And it also gives us free skill feats once we qualify for them. Intimidating Glare, which the pre-qualification is just that we need to be trained in Intimidation, so check there, free skill feat. Now we can just intimidate with a look and we don't need to speak a creature's language. As well as the Scare to Death skill feat, which is super cool but it requires us to be level 15, so we're not gonna get to it on this character. But yeah, with Scared to Death, you can literally just one-shot an enemy by scaring them. It's one of my favorite things in all of Pathfinder. <laughs> all right, level five, we get so many things. Ability boosts, first up. We're gonna bump the same things. Strength to 19, Constitution to 18, Charisma to 14, and Wisdom to 14. We get an Ancestry feat, and I for sure am taking Vengeful Hatred here. It's perfectly on point for us. You choose an ancient dwarven enemy, and in our case, we're taking, you guessed it, giants, and thereafter get a circumstance bonus to damage against those creatures. For us, it will be plus two damage at the moment, but also, if any creature critically hits us, then we get that bonus damage against that creature that crit us for a minute, regardless of what type of creature they are. And that's just so cool. It fits perfectly into this lore of a grudge-holding dwarf, right? And for us, a raging grudge-holding dwarven sledgehammer, it's just the best. For our skill increase at level five, I would take intimidation to expert for sure, giving us a nice bump to those demoralized checks that were kind of building around, or at least giving ourselves an option to use. And then there is the almighty fighter weapon mastery. So yeah, most other martial classes finally get to catch up to fighters here by getting expert proficiency in their trained weapons, right? Well, fighters at the same level get bumped to master training, so they continue to stay ahead of everybody. Now, you will only get this bump with one weapon group, so it's not all weapons, choose wisely. I'm sticking with hammers here. We also, happily, get access to the critical specialization effect of that weapon group. And it's the main reason, aside from thematic ones, that I wanted to go with hammers. As a reminder, each weapon group has an associated critical specialization effect. And if you have access to those critical specialization effects, and that's not always an automatic guarantee, you have to have a feature that actually grants you that access, right? Then, depending on the weapon, when you get a critical hit, you 
do something extra. With hammers, you knock them prone. And that felt pretty perfect since even though we're going to be doing our best to knock our enemies prone with knockdown, sometimes we're gonna roll poorly on that athletics check or they're gonna have a really high reflex save. So having a backup way to potentially knock them prone is really great. And yeah, it just works on any creature that we get a critical hit on. There's no save, no size restriction, nothing. So if you crit on a gargantuan enemy, whoom, prone. And with a plus two to hit over everyone else, like I've said, fighters do tend to crit more often than others. So this is something I think that's gonna show up for us kind of a lot. Okay, at level five, it is time for our first damage report. Let's talk about what tactics look like for our little wrecking ball. On round one, you're gonna be raging getting into position most likely and making an attack, right? But thereafter, assuming you don't need to move or anything on your turn, of course, the plan is to use knockdown to attack them and try to trip them. We will then make an oft ill-advised third attack at yeah, a minus 10 penalty to hit. But to be fair, if they're prone and as a fighter, our likelihood of hitting them even then is a lot higher than most. Anyway, if we succeed on tripping them with knockdown or we get a critical hit on either of our strikes, then the enemy is prone, and guess what? On their turn, they are totally gonna stand up. I mean, if they don't, great. They remain flat-footed and have a minus two on all of their attacks. But if and when they do, yeah, since standing is a move action, we get a third strike this round with attack of opportunity. And since the attack is not made on our turn, it doesn't suffer from any multi-attack penalty and it is glorious. Now, there are assumptions that I'm making here. First of all, Yes, I'm assuming the enemy is flat-footed to us, even though we might not always have them flanked. Do your best to flank them or otherwise get them flat-footed, but fortunately, yes, once they're prone, they are flat-footed. I am also, as always, assuming we have magic items as per the automatic bonus progression table from the game mastery guide, meaning that by this point we would have an extra plus one to hit, one more die of damage on our weapon for 2d12 per hit, ouch. And yes, even a plus one to our skill of choice. We, of course, would take athletics for that. And since bonuses to athletics checks don't stack here with potency bonuses from our weapon, if that weapon had a trip trait on them, like if we were to try and use that weapon to trip, right? So again, there was no real reason to take a scythe over the higher damage D12 maul. It doesn't give us any additional benefit to our trip attacks. Assuming we've got that plus one to a skill, whether via the automatic bonus progression table or like a lifting belt or whatever. But then I'm going to assume that you managed to knock your enemy prone on your turn 75% of the time. It's an estimate. It's going to vary depending on the enemy's AC depending on their reflex save. But to save myself a lot of effort and brain cramps, I'm estimating 75%, and I do feel like that's pretty accurate. But assuming that the enemy is prone, then yes, we get a third attack when the enemy stands up on their turn, meaning we'll be making three attacks that do 2d12 each of damage, plus four for our strength, plus two for our rage, for a total of 6d12 plus 18. And so, against enemies with what is typically considered to be a low AC at this level, which the Game Mastery Guide says is a 19 here, we would on average do 59 damage per round on our turn. And against a high AC enemy, which is supposedly a 22 here, it would be 48 DPR. And yeah, okay, that's better than any other build I've done to date at this level, except the reigning champion thief. Now. Some of you might be crying foul because I'm making assumptions that I shouldn't be making, perhaps. But the truth is, I'm really not making any assumptions here that I don't make on other builds. That the enemy is flat-footed. That a very important situation for our damage actually happened 75% of the time, etc, etc. So, if I need to temper numbers for over-assuming here, then I think I'd need to temper numbers across the board for other builds, right? In the end, I think the gap would generally remain the same between the builds that I've done to date at this level. And to be fair, the thief is only winning out by a few points here. Let's see if we can catch up. At level six, we get another fighter feat and I wanna take advantageous assault. It's an ability with the press feature, meaning again, that we can't do this on our first attack on our turn, but we wouldn't want to do this 
right off anyways because it has us make an attack against an enemy that is restrained, grabbed, or prone. And if we hit, we get to do extra damage equal to two, since we're using our weapon with two hands, plus the number of weapon damage dice, so four total. It's not a huge number, and it will only work against a compromised target, which means for us, if we're starting out with knockdown, yeah, this is only applying on our third attack at a minus 10 to hit. But, you know, if we're trying to knock them prone anyways, and we're planning on making another attack with our third action once in a while, it's a decent little damage bump for if and when we hit. As for the skill feat that we get at this level, I'm just gonna go ahead and say PYF, pick your favorite. Take something that just really helps you fulfill the dream and vision that you have for your character concept. But as for the barbarian archetype feat at this level, I'd recommend the instinct ability feat. This, finally, actually gives us some benefit to the Barbarian Instinct that we chose. Every Barbarian Instinct gets an Instinct ability, and yeah, this archetype feat just gives us access to that, where regular Barbarians just kind of get it for free. For Giants, it's called Titan Mauler. We're already a Titan Wrestler. Might as well be a Titan Mauler while we're at it. Does this mean we maul Titans, or we maul like a Titan? Maybe both. Regardless, it tells us that we can now use a weapon that's typically made for larger creatures. There's no special list of like large weapons or anything for us to consult here. All regular weapons can be made for larger creatures. They normally just have twice the cost and twice the bulk, but otherwise are functionally the same. So go ahead and get your hands now on a large maul that was made for a large creature. When you use it, your rage damage goes from a plus two to a plus six. Sweet. Now, it does come with a big, huge honkin' downside, and it's that when we are doing this, we have the clumsy one condition, which we can't reduce or remove in any way. And this is why people say taking giant is a bad idea. Clumsy one is going to mean that we have a minus one penalty to everything that uses our dexterity, including skill checks, reflex saves, and yeah, armor class, even if we're wearing full plate. And that kind of sucks. We've been talking about having a plus two to hit over other characters is a really big deal for fighters. Well, now we're giving our enemies essentially a plus two to hit us. If you combine the minus one we're already getting from rage, right? So yeah, instead you might have wanted to go dragon instinct for a plus four rage bonus instead of plus six. Or spirit for a plus three, but also the benefits of the ghost touch property rune, which is a lot more effective against incorporeal foes. But I mean, come on, you guys know me by now, right? Caution? We don't need no stinking caution. Besides, this just continues to fit the concept we've got going here of a raging bull in a china shop wrecking ball, right? I welcome the devil may care clumsiness, as well as the extra damage, of course. Again, feel free to go another route if you want to be a little more prudent. I won't think less of you, I promise. Hopefully you won't think less of me for doing what I've done. <laughs> Exploring the limits of what's possible not what's advisable. All right, at level seven, we get the Battlefield Surveyor feature, which bumps our training and perception to master and gives us an additional plus two bonus to initiative rolls when we're using perception for a total of a plus four to our initiatives here. Very nice. For the general feat we get at this level, I'm tempted to take incredible initiative to really take those initiative rolls to the next level, but I think I'd rather have toughness instead. This just gives us an additional hit point per character level and lowers the DC of our recovery checks by one. Considering our clumsy raging selves with a minus two to our armor class, that's probably the better bet, right? For our skill increase at this level, I think we need to take athletics to master for a higher likelihood of tripping our enemies, among other things. And then finally at level seven, we get weapon specialization, which just like for all marshals, increases our weapon damage by two, except wait, since we have master proficiency, it increases our damage by three. Insult to injury. At level eight, we get another fighter feat, and I kind of like felling strike here. As a melee weapon user, one big potential weakness that we have is to flying enemies. Sure, we can and should carry like some light hammers with us or whatever to throw in that case, but our damage kind of falls through the floor in that scenario, yeah. Well, with felling strike, if we hit a flying enemy and deal damage, the enemy just falls to the ground. 
This would be especially awesome if they took falling damage, but alas, they do not. Now, falling strike takes two actions, so that's not great, but it is a nice option to have if you need it. Maybe you can get one more attack on your turn if they fall at your feet, or at least let your other melee companions try to take them out or grapple them, etc. For the skill feat at this level, there's actually something I do want to recommend here, and it's wall jump. You have to be level 7 to take it and have master proficiency in athletics, but now that we have both of those things, it's just super cool. This feat tells us that if we're adjacent to a wall at the end of our jump, then we can jump again, pushing off the wall, right? Like Prince of Persia style. To try and reach an otherwise unreachable enemy, or grab a ledge, etc. I doubt we'd actually use this all that often, but when we did, it'd be super awesome. Might as well keep building on the quick jump and powerful leap feats that we've already got. Speaking of, we also get a Barbarian Archetype feat here, and I would go with Advanced Fury, which lets us take another Barbarian feat equal to half our character level, so level 4 feats now, right? And I say we go Raging Athlete. It gives us a climb and swim speed equal to our move speed while we're raging, which is pretty situationally fantastic. And decreases the DC of our jumps and increases the distance we can jump. We're kind of like a bouncy ball wrecking ball now, <laughs> instead of just a regular wrecking ball. At level 9, we get such a great dwarven ancestry feat, Mountain Stoutness. Building on that immovable object theme, like toughness, this feat increases our hit point 1 per level and further decreases the DC of our recovery checks, but the best part is, if you have both this feat and toughness, the recovery check DC is essentially decreased by 4, meaning you are almost never going to die, despite our poor decisions about the whole minus 2 to AC thing. I think for the skill increase we get at level 9, I'd probably bump Intimidation to Master. I appreciate that with Intimidating Strike, you might not often be trying to demoralize your enemies here. But considering that demoralize is only one action and can be done from range, I like having the ability to use it sometimes. I mean, one potential tactic here is to demoralize with your first action and then knock down with your second two, right? That third attack isn't going to land very often, and particularly against enemies with a high AC and or a high reflex save, it could be the difference between you landing your strike and or succeeding on your trip. And that's going to be more valuable than that second strike with your third action, right? Building around demoralize is by no means necessary here, but I like having options. Speaking of options, we also get a pretty fantastic fighter feature here called Combat Flexibility. This basically lets us learn any fighter feat of 8th level or lower once per day that we can swap out daily to give ourselves some pretty nice flexibility. I think my default one would probably be Sudden Leap. I mean, we've already got the best bouncy wrecking ball ever. Might as well keep going. Sudden Leap lets us use two actions to jump and make a melee strike and if we have Felling Strike, we can combine Sudden Leap with Felling Strike for a three-action activity to jump, attack, and knock them to the ground, which is situationally pretty useful and super cinematic. Finally, at level 9, fighters get Juggernaut. It raises our proficiency in Fortitude saves to Master and tells us that if we succeed on a Fortitude save, it's an automatic critical success instead. So good. At level 10, we get more ability boosts. We're going to keep going with what we've been doing all along, taking Strength to 20, Constitution to 19, Charisma to 16, and Wisdom to 16. And that's awesome, but maybe my favorite thing at level 10 is the fighter feat I've been kind of salivating over this entire time, Improved Knockdown. With this feat, instead of taking two actions to strike then trip, we just make a single strike. It still takes two actions, we're still using Knockdown, but if the strike hits, it not only just automatically trips them, but it automatically applies the critical success of a trip. Now, a critical success on a trip means that the enemy both falls prone and takes bludgeoning damage. And with this feat, if you're using a two-handed weapon, they take the weapon's damage die instead of the usual 1d6. It's, it's not a huge bump, but it does mean an extra d12 of damage when we hit with that strike on improved knockdown. So that's basically a 3d12 attack now. Now, sure, you still have to take two actions to do this, like I've said, but automatically succeeding on the trip 
if we simply land our attack, is just going to make knocking them prone that much more reliable, especially against high reflex save enemies. And I love it. For our skill feat here, I think I'd take Battle Cry, since we've got Master Proficiency in Intimidation, which is a prerequisite here. It lets us demoralize an enemy as a free action whenever we roll initiative. A free Frightened Condition on an enemy of our choice to start off combat is pretty wonderful. For our Barbarian Archetype feat, I think I'd just take Advanced Fury again, and this time take Fast Movement. It gives us another 10 feet of move speed while raging, and now 35 feet of move speed feels way better than 25. We are now a very speedy boulder rolling down the mountain. Gravity works. For our final damage report then, since last check, we've increased our strength modifier by one, added some extra damage when we hit a prone enemy, and extra damage to our rage thanks to Titan Mauler at the cost of being a little more clumsy. We got another d12 on our first strike on our turn thanks to improved knockdown. We did pick up another plus one to hit from the automatic bonus progression chart that simulates magic item increases, right? As well as a little extra damage from weapon specialization, plus three, and then a whole slew of great utility, defensive, and even debuffing capabilities. We are absolutely living our best wrecking ball lives at the moment. One thing to note, instead of just assuming a 75% chance of knocking them down now, I can be a little more precise thanks to improved knockdown, where if we hit, they're just automatically tripped. And I know our percent chance of hitting based on our plus to hit and the enemy AC, right? So I can just apply that percentage chance to hit to the damage of what our opportunity attack would do to get a little more accurate representation of our damage. Make sense? Anyway, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 98 damage per round. That's a 27 AC, by the way. And against high enemy AC, which we're told would be a 30 at this level, we would do 71 DPR on average. And compared to other builds that I've done to date, that's better than all of them. Except the Thief Rogue. <laughs> Uh, which is about, you know, seven or eight percent better is all. Holy cow, what does that mean? Is the thief OP? Is the fighter not as overpowered as everyone seems to think? Okay, deep breaths, everybody. Let's discuss it in the final thoughts. So yeah, through 10 levels, this fighter is out damaging everyone except the thief. But here's the thing about these numbers. I always calculate them under best case scenario situations and sometimes make assumptions that aren't always going to pan out in the game, right? The thing that really put the thief head and shoulders above the rest for those that don't remember was that I was assuming that 75% of the time you would get an attack with your reaction thanks to the combination of both the ranger's disrupt prey which is very similar to attack of opportunity and even better I think the rogue's opportune backstab which gives a reaction attack when a nearby ally hits an enemy within your reach with a melee attack. It seems to me that that would happen about 75% of the time but Obviously, that's gonna vary from table to table and encounter to encounter. If you only have one other melee ally in your party, and especially if your other melee allies aren't necessarily trying to focus fire the bad guys and play super tactically, that number's gonna be lower than 75%. But by the same token, our wrecking ball is sometimes gonna run into enemies with great reflex saves, or at least up until we got to level 10, right? Or we're just gonna flat out roll poorly on our trip attempts. So that 75% that I was assuming where our enemy would be tripped and then standing up to give us a reaction attack on this build is also gonna vary from encounter to encounter. Maybe the one thing that we should highlight about the thief though is this. Another assumption I always make is that the enemy is flat-footed, right? This is because there are so many ways to get your enemy flat-footed in Pathfinder, and at least one of them, flanking, is something that you generally are going to have some pretty decent control over, though of course I understand that there will be times when flanking might be impossible, or nearly so. Now, for most builds, a flat-footed enemy is just 
basically going to increase your hit chance by two. In the thief's case, however, and actually the magus's as well, but to a lesser extent, not getting a flat-footed enemy means much, much more. For rogues, a huge part of their damage is coming from sneak attack, and sneak attack only works if the enemy is flat-footed. It's 2d6 per strike at level 5, and it was 4d6 at level 10 thanks to precise debilitations. No, I am not going to start trying to make assumptions on a percentage likelihood that an enemy is flat-footed or whatever. It's just more time than I'm interested in spending, and in the end, all of these numbers are estimates based on enemy AC, saving throws, what's going on in the battlefield, etc, etc, right? They're done in a lab. They're never intended to perfectly simulate actual combat encounters because they never could. But sure. If we lowered the benefit all of these builds received from flat-footed enemies, it would hurt the thief a lot more than others, potentially bringing them in line with our fighter today, or maybe even dropping them below, depending on what the likelihood was that we estimated that the enemy would be flat-footed. To be honest, then, I think that what the exercise today has shown me isn't so much that people are necessarily wrong about the fighter, it's more that I think people severely underestimate the thief rogue's potential. Nevertheless, I do think that the extra plus two to hit that fighters get over pretty much every other class is incredibly strong. But I'm also just not that convinced that it's as OP as a lot of people seem to think. I'm positive, at the very least, that the best rogue is not a fighter with a rogue archetype. Mostly, of course, because there's more to the game than just damage. Come on! I mean, I've been trying to tell you guys that for like th almost three years now. <laughs> but even if we were just talking about damage, the lower sneak attack scaling and slower feet and skill progression that we would get by going fighter plus rogue archetype versus straight rogue is sizable. Maybe the plus two to hit from fighter makes up for that gap, but I think that if nothing else, the numbers are a lot closer than most people think. In the end, I absolutely love the bouncing wrecking ball that we ended up with today. I love not only the damage that they bring, which is immense, but the ways that they're helping out their allies by making their enemy prone almost every turn and or frightening them when they can't, sometimes both. They are a terrifying, menacing sledgehammer of destruction, and I, for one, am here for it. So anyway. That's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really had a lot of fun kind of trying to crack this code and solve this puzzle today. I hope you know that I love you guys. You're so fantastic. Thank you for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, I hope you'll hang in there. And I also hope that you are good and kind and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Came in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> I don't even know that song. I know that it exists, but my vibe tends to be usually a lot more like, cause when you worry your face will frown and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry, cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. Be happy, cuckoo. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> My teleprompter has stopped working. That's not good. So, no, that's still not right. <laughs> I always gotta pull out the Royals shirt. It's baseball season, spring is in the air. I was born in Kansas City but I'm not actually a huge baseball fan. I don't follow the sport all that much. I've been to a spring training game. I went to some Royals games when I was like a baby, too young to remember. I watch them when they're in the playoffs. One day, I'm gonna get back to KC and actually go to like a real game. That said, <clears throat> I hate my microphone. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. You are struggling today. Eh. <laughs> and yeah, okay, well. Um, well, don't even say that. <whistles> oh.
automatically applies the critical success of a trip, and I didn't include that in my numbers. Hold, please. And we're back. I hate it when I have to do that. So I was just taking everything down for um, the, my thumbnail. I've just been doing the thumbnail like this without the pictures in the background. And noticed that, uh, that Gandalf in the Balrog just fell halfway through the video or so. <laughs> did, you guys, did you guys notice? The Grey Wizard has fallen into the hearts of Khazad-dûm. At least he took the Balrog with him. Fly, you fools!